Welcome to this uh, brief talk on extensive lengthening for achondroplasia and other forms of dwarfism. We're very pleased to inform you that we have at least 29 years of experience in this form of extensive limb lengthening in achondroplasia, which is the commonest form of dwarfism uh, at the Center for Elizar of Techniques in Akola, Maharashtra, India. I uh, <coughs> As we know, achondroplasia is the commonest form of dwarfism. And this is a picture taken from the archives more than 150 years ago from India showing achondroplastic, a dwarf, a normal person, as well as other types of dwarfism, including cretinaceous dwarfism. Similarly, this is a diagram that shows the different types of dwarfism as compared to a normal person. Uh, achondro is the commonest form. The pseudoachondroplasia is not so common. The spondyla epiphyseal dysplasia and other forms of dwarfism due to cretinism, hypothyroidism, etc., really look physiognomically a little different. Coming to achondroplasia, it's the commonest form of short limb dwarfism, is present in about 1 out of 25,000 births, in which the main thing for us to know is that the upper segment to lower segment ratio is 1 is to 0 0.6. In normal persons, this ratio is almost. 1 to 1 1.06 that is the limbs are a little longer than the upper segment which gives us the possibility of lengthening them in general you can say that achondroplastic dwarfism is a little akin to the kind of problems faced by dash on dogs in which the lengths if they're sitting upright is normal but the anterior posterior diameter of the spine is reduced so the clinical features of achondroplasia are well known as not easy to miss, there is frontal bossing, there's a depressed bridge of the nose, there's a poor mid-face formation and a large head. The upper limbs have incomplete extension of the elbows, trifid hands that is separation between the third and the fourth fingers and the fingers are short and stubby. In the lower limb there is bow legs with upper tibial varus and with increasing age the varus increases in the lower part of the tibia as well. There's a reduced rotation of the hips and they can generally not sit cross-legged. On x-rays, they have chevron-shaped metaphyses with longer fibulae, tibial varus, and also have coxa breva with hydrocanters. In the spine, they have foramen magnum stenosis, cervical and lumbar canal stenosis, which typically manifest in the third decade or so clinically. And they also have dorsal kyphosis and lumbar hyperlordosis. The foramen magnum stenosis and the cervical canal stenosis make them susceptible to paraparesis or weakness of the upper and the lower limbs and one should beware of taking on such patient lengthening. In our culture and mythology, the dwarf plays a very important role. Lord Vishnu has the Vamana avatar in which he takes the form of a dwarf for a very short person who subjugates the tyrant king Bali by asking him only for three steps as shown in this one. In our iconography, Lord Nataraja, form of Shiva, is seen dancing and if one takes a good close-up look his feet are, are trampling upon the dwarf demon apasmara apasmara possibly stands for uh, you know ignorance and uh, so in a sense in our mythology we have reviled as well as revered the dwarf so the question that, that arises is why lengthen people who are dwarfs because they have functional impairment in society and to prevent ostracism and cruelty well as i can tell you we started our experience in lengthening achondroplastic dwarfs way back in 1990 and started with this young lady from bangalore who at the age of 13 years was fully mature and was only 3 foot 11 inches in height by performing bilateral double level tibia lengthening we managed to give her 14 centimeters of length cane as you can see from the picture this she finished her treatment in the February of 1992 and uh, you know so she's done really well this is here she is with a young surgeon who managed to start this with as one of definitely the first dwarf in this part of Asia to undergo lengthening. Now the genetic basis for dwarfism is the defect in the FGFR3 gene that's the fibroblastic growth factor receptor 3 gene and the cytogenetic location of this gene also has been determined. Now the clinical basis for lengthening and the possibility of lengthening arises because we know that there is delayed mature of maturation of chondrocytes in the hypertrophic zone of the physis 
and this reduced longitudinal growth of the bone, but the length of the muscles is normal. We know from our clinical experience that most of the resistance that comes to lengthening comes from the tight muscles or aponeurosis or fascia. And hence in these hapless people, the possibility of lengthening improves because they have got redundantly long muscles. How much to lengthen is a big question. Well, our pragmatic philosophy says that we lengthen the maximum safe amount possible. But we do not have a predefined amount or an extent or a number to reach. We do not aim for a number like 10 centimeters, etc. Uh, and of course, the most important of all, we monitor the process. We monitor the nerve and joint function in order to ensure that there are no neurological problems or there is no tightness of the joints or resultant contractures or deformities. Um, what we believe is that we should start lengthening early because age is on our side and what we can do when we start early and apply the techniques in a proper manner, we can change lives. Perhaps it would not be wrong of me to say that very rarely in the course of orthopedic surgery can you really change somebody's lives. You can of course restore limbs, you can correct deformities, you can you know, cure them of arthritis or cure them from debilitating pain. But to transform somebody's life is possible only in lengthening in a contrastic dwarfism. Let me begin with the story of this five-year-old who came to us from the city of Pune. And we could determine that she's an achondroplastic dwarf. And uh, the parents were understanding enough to realize what's going to happen. And they agreed to performing early lengthening. So she had lengthening in both her TBA with uh, double level, uh, you know, corticotomies. She did develop a temporary lateral popliteal nerve palsy, which we waited, allowed it to recover, and then did a repeat corticotomy to resume the lengthening. And as you can see, she went on to develop 11 centimeters of length. There are no deformities. And you can see from the photograph of her ankle that she's got full function and recovered nerves. She had 88% lengthening. To restore the body proportions, we also lengthened her humeri by 9 centimeters. And you can see now that her arms are coming to the level just distant to the mid thighs. This is very crucial because if the arms remain short, these children are forced to bend down in order for perennial hygiene and other reasons, which leads to one of the, which is one of the causes of the dorsal kyphosis. And then at a later age, because she started lengthening early, we could also perform a cross lengthening of her tibia as well as the femur again. Uh, this shows you her good function. And then at the end of this treatment, by the age of 16 years, she had achieved a total of 33 centimeters of length and became 4 foot 11 inches in height and the best part of it is so that because she became a short normal she could find happiness and she got married to the person of her choice and continues to work as a radio jockey so from a dwarf to a short normal with a normal lifestyle is a really uh, wonderful transformation for her about which we are very pleased so we start lengthening these children at an early age when the parents understand and it really helps them to get started in school, not be ostracized, not be, you know, taunted and teased by their other schoolmates. And it gives them the confidence to go about in society as near normals, which is one very important reason for lengthening early. So this young lad had lengthening of his tibia and the femur before he reached school age, which is going to big thing for him. Also, this uh, young lady from Kolkata had uh, lengthening of about four centimeters. Not more. We don't do too much in the first stage when they are young, just enough to give them that little edge to shift them from being dwarfs, you know, before they reach school. Uh, we can perform different strategies like bilateral tibial lengthening followed by bilateral femoral lengthening, as we did in this young lady who had lengthening of her tibia to an extensive amount of twelve centimeters. And then also we lengthened her femora with LRS fixators like so. So she became a short normal. And she studied, became an engineer, and has full range of it, and found gainful employment as an engineer in the MSEDCL, that's the electricity board. And finally, when she had enough confidence, she also lengthened. Now she's able to function very well in society, ride her own two-wheeler to work, as well as she can ferry her parents about and functions as a perfectly normal individual. 
So when you start late as opposed to starting early, there can be significant difficulties as in the case of this 12 year old who came to us from Kuwait. By this age, they become obese and also obstinate because they have been teased a lot in school and it's been imbued upon their tender minds that they're different and that they're somehow inferior. And so the lengthening may not be so easy. However, we did manage to give them 15 centimeters of length gain in 11 months with a bilateral double level tibia lengthening. He's done well. He's now an entrepreneur at the age of 30 and he functions reasonably well. However, because he started late, he could not take the decision of also lengthening his femora and his humeri because the societal structure in India, um, and he's an Indian, he's of Indian origin, do not permit these children to take a lot of time off in the formative stages of their late high school and early college careers, which is what handicaps them and makes it unable for them to go through the lending process. So our experience in terms of statistics is that we have performed percentage of lengthening of approximately 63% in the tibia, 49, that's almost 50% in the femur and the humerus. We've had 23 achondroplastic dwarfs and eight other types of dwarfism. And a total number of regenerates we've lengthened about 114. We've lengthened from 7 to 17 in the tibia, 8 to 17 in the femur, and 8 to 10 in the humerus. The external fixation index has been approximately 30 days per centimeter in the tibia, 25 in the femur, and 28 in the humerus. We've had no atrophic regenerates. However, we'd had 4% regenerate fractures as compared to the 30% regenerate fractures reported by Song, Dev, Murari et al. in JBJS American. This is because we're careful enough to determine each patient as an individual and determine when to stop the lengthening or monitor the progress of the regenerate bone as opposed to following a set pattern and determining that they all need to have let's say 10 centimeters of lengthening etc so we've had some premature consolidations which needed a repeat cortichotomy we've had a tiny amount of limb length discrepancy of 5 to 10 millimeters uh, in a few patients because we did determine we did discover the discrepancy there were premature consolidations but some of the children were not willing to undergo a second corticotomy to correct this problem the discrepancy is too small however to worry about and there is no issues we've had a one anterior subluxation of the knee joint loss of range of motion of less than 20 percent in five percent of the case and we've had very few severe axial deviations So the strategies of lengthening we employed are cross lengthening and then humoral lengthening or bilateral tibial then femoral and then humoral lengthening. So here is the example of a young lady who is the daughter of a doctor and she had cross lengthening to begin because the parents knew that they wanted to go through lengthening all the four segments. At this point in time, I would like to make a brief note that we never ever perform lengthening of all four segments at the same time because it's in our country, it's very difficult for the parents to manage to bring the children, the nutritional levels and the difficulties encountered in controlling the pain and difficulties in all four segments is such that we do not believe in performing simultaneous four segment lengthening. So this young lady had cross lengthening of the sides and got a significant amount of length, did a humoral lengthening. And, you know, she had minor difficulties with valgus, which we corrected with in osteotomy and a guided and here she is with a full benefit that she dived with full range of motion in her knees, which is so crucial. And now she's successfully finished her medical education and is a dermatologist. Finally, a couple of examples. This young lady uh, started at the age of 15 years and went on to do cross lengthening for the femur and the tibia. And she developed a very good amount of 27 centimeters of length between the femur and the tibia. And here she is with her dad before and after surgery. And you can see her life is transformed. She's become a chartered accountant. And I would like to end with saying that if we give these children a chance to start early, then as in the case of this young lad who is also an engineer, their height is transformed, their lives are transformed, and they can function well in society as short normals. So uh, dear viewer and friends, I would like to emphasize that when you come across a patient with achondroplasia, please remember that in India, 
we have been doing this treatment for the last 29 years and it is possible for us to transform the lives of these people rather than condemn them forever perpetually to a life of ridicule, ostracism and difficulties in functioning in society. We can lengthen them extensively and make them from dwarfs to short novels. I thank you for your attention.